Hi, everyone. Uh, wrong way. <laughs> Thank you for joining the GDB BOF. I wasn't expecting so many people. <laughs> and uh, I, oh, I've always wanted to do a presentation with Notepad. So today's the day. <laughs> <laughs> I had to steal this computer from my child, my son. Um, uh, right, so the point is to discuss whatever you guys want to discuss. Yeah, I just wondering, is there some question? Uh, yeah, the people on the Zoom can speak. Uh, so. Uh, audience, yeah, yeah, there, are, there are five people on the Zoom, yeah. So we can check. Uh, Hi. So, yeah, we can, we can probably tell them that they can speak in the most. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and I have a question. So, hi guys on Zoom. Uh, you have audio. If you want to speak, we can hear you. Uh, I think that, is there a way to, for them to raise their hand or something? Yeah, they can raise their hand. Okay. But they seem to be sleeping. <laughs> okay, I will write them to chat. Uh, so, I wish I were a little bit more prepared for this. Uh, the only thing I have on, to show you on the screen is that. <laughs> my, my goal was to add things as we, as we go along. And just this morning, I was going through the news entry, news file uh, of GDB, and I, I realized, wow, I used to do that thing at the beginning of, of BOFs where I would go over the changes in GDB in the last year, but it's been three years already since I've done that. You know, We had something in Portugal, COVID, I don't know if you had it. Yeah, glad to be back. Um, so, and I was reading that and we've done a bunch of stuff, and, but the things that to me were really important things were that we've finally made GDB uh, multi-threaded program and we started taking advantage of more than one core in GDB. Uh, and, and that's been a great improvement for debug information reading speed. Um, and I remember that when I had this session a few years ago that we were discussing the, the test suite and the RACI problems and we had a discussion about that and I remember Tom saying, yeah, I'll take a look at that. And you had, certainly have been looking at that. Uh, so the, the test suite is you know, much, much, much more stable today than it was back then. Um, and then I, you know, those were like the big ticket items that just came to me. Uh, but certainly there were a lot of things, other things that uh, happened. Um, people reach out to me to add topics to the buff. Uh, one of them was how about moving beyond C++11. Um, I had a comment about discussing using reviewed by tags. We don't use it currently. Uh, and Luis had sent on the mailing list uh, a few days ago uh, some topics about basic uh, maintenance, uh, you know, patch review, how can we do better patch review, do more patch review. Uh, can we think about using some patch tracking uh, tool to keep track of patches because it's hard to just uh, do it using the mailing list. Um, and raise the uh, idea of doing pre-commit testing using build bot infrastructure. Um, and yeah, this, so these are topics we can discuss. Um, and if other people have other topics to discuss, uh, feel free. Um, so I think C++11 was like Simon, was it? Um, yeah, and Lance Lab, so. Uh, let me hand the mic to the audience so we can speak. Yeah, it's basically the question. Yeah. Um, it, no, it's on. Oh, I'm, I was not speaking loud enough. The question was, can we move to C++ 14, maybe 17 at some point? 
Um, yeah, we did have discussion, and so I think there is an entry somewhere in the wiki which describes what's supposed to be the rule for bumping the C++ standard we use. And bottom line is, uh, as long as every major distribution or platform we target does have a way to have a decent compiler targeting that, uh, we should be okay. So uh, the next question is what the least targets we want to actually support, which I don't really know. Um, which do we, version do we want to support? Um, what targets and what distributions oh, and okay, what, uh, like, yeah. if you want to go expect all of them to check that they do have a C++ 14 or 17 compiler, what target people actually care about, which BS, uh, BSD do we have to test, and yeah. that I don't know. Yeah, so uh, I can speak a little bit about that. Um, so when we started doing the uh, C++ conversion from C to C++, uh, we had an agreement that we would uh, support uh, C++, use C++ 98 or 03, uh, and we were blocked by OpenBSD at the time because it was the uh, version that uh, OpenBSD supported with the system compiler. Um, but the funny fact was, fun fact was happened was that shortly after, a few months after, I don't remember how many, but maybe three or four, um, we started adding some replacements to uh, cl template classes that are very useful in C++11, one of them being uh, unique pointer, and uh, ma made it work with C++03, and then people really, really hated that. Uh, and so that, that spawned a, a huge discussion on the list of why are we re-implementing things in C++11, let's just use it. And you're like, yeah, let's do that. We're, we were just adding fallbacks because we were blocked by some operating systems. But at the time we investigated really what, how, how hard would it be to install um, some secondary compiler in those systems, like for example, in, in RHEL or Fedora, in RHEL you can install DTS, which is called GDS nowadays. So it's very easy if your system compiler only supports C++ 11, but then you have DTS really just a, a command to install it, then it supports C++ 17. Okay, so that's good enough. And same thing with other operating systems. Uh, SUSE has its own stable uh, version of the distro, but then has a way to install a newer compiler, I think. Uh, Mike. Uh. Yeah, there's Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's mostly the requirement to do things with the distro compiler, and we go back to 4.8, so 4.8.5. So I'm not sure. Is C14 already? No. So 4.8, it's what it's the minimal version that GDB as a project claims. That's a minimal version you you have to have to compile GDB, because 4.8.1 or something was the first version of GCC that supported reasonably. The mm -hmm. C++ 11 wasn't fully complete, but it was sufficient. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so if we want to bump from that, we have to move past 4.8. Yeah, I also know that the build bot uses uh, CentOS, which uses that same GCC version. Right, so but CentOS, I think we could install TTS or GTS. Does it work on CentOS? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Hmm. So, yeah, so we had this discussion back then, which was, I think, 2015 or 2016. And one thing that came out of that discussion was everyone agreed that we don't want to make it e harder for people to compile GDB. If it, if it moving to C++11 at the time meant that everyone had to compile their own com GCC, that's not what we wanted. But if it was easy to just install the package, then it's, it might be a little bit of effort, but it's easy. Uh, and the, but people insisted that that needs to be codified somehow. And so we came up with a rule, which is, I think something like, um, you can bump your GCC, your C++ requirements, if there's a, a system compiler or one of those easy to install packages that supports the standard 
for at least three years. So say that was a, a, a rail system that was out that had a GCC version that was at least three years old that supported C17. Good, we could switch to C17. That was what we could have found back then. Um, and the idea was whenever we want to bump again, we will use the same rule. But of course, rules can always be rediscussed. Um, and then the question from Lancelot is how do I know which operating systems matter? Where should I apply that rule? And that, that part we don't have codified. The, at the time, it was understood as the major distros like Fedora, Debian, Ubuntu, SUSE, and then for BSDs, I think that w the point was that at the time they were already switching to Clang, even though some of them hadn't yet, but that was the plan. And we thought we shouldn't be blocked by them because they're not bumping GCC because of licensing reasons or whatever. Uh, and they want to move to Clang, so let's just look at what Clang supports and Clang, you know, uh, it was okay. So I think today for BSCs we should apply the same rule. Um, and I think they tend to have modern versions uh, in, in the, their distros, but I'm not exactly sure. Um, so the question is, can we bump uh, to a newer version? I, I think I think we can, but I haven't done that, this investigation. If someone can do it and report back. And yeah, as, yeah, as for my side, I, it's not a blocker for us, but it just means for my side more work for package maintaining because I need to support an older version of GDB on an older distro, that's all. Okay. But, so I'd rather not do that effort, but <laughs> okay. yeah. Um, right, so someone needs to do that and come up with a... <laughs> so it, it, remember, this is not about what you can debug. Like you could build GDB with GCC 13. Is it 13 now? <laughs> I lost track. Uh, and you know, debug programs that were built with four dot, whatever. Uh, it's two different things. Well, at least you need to be able to run that GDB on the system. Like, you need to have the little kind of C++, you need to have the little kind of C++ in the dependency group. Right, yes. So, right, so the, you need to have the runtime. You can build it. Yeah. You can maybe link libstand and C++ statically. Yeah. And so, because like customers want to debug as well. So, but you're in that operating system, a stable one, you're not going to be bumping the system GDB version and ship that to users, right? Oh, yeah, it's, sure, it's we, do, we are doing that all the time. So it's when you want to build a newer GDB in that system for some reason. So we are, we are actually, we are shipping the current GDB even on the very old code streams. And currently we are building them with the system compiler okay. everywhere because that's 4.8. And in, in theory, for SUSE, it's not a very big issue to build with GCC 7 that, because we also ship the newer lib C++ runtime to all customers. Okay. But just the runtime, not, not the okay. easy compiler. So but, but others may have this issue. They, they can possibly build with a newer compiler, but the newer build GDB wouldn't run on the customer system because the runtime is not there. Yeah. Can the mic? Yeah. And Red Hat does some other hacks to avoid that problem. Right. Tell them how it is. So in RHEL, right, the, the newer compiler that you use to build the newer GDB, we ship the, we have a hybrid linkage model where all the new C++ features get linked in, so therefore that GDB can run on old RHEL without having any worry about it. So I, don't, I think for, from the RHEL side, it works, right? So we ship GCC toolset or developer toolset, and if, you, if new GDB were to use new features, it's compiled by the new compiler, so it uses the, can use those new C++ features without worry about the runtime. 
But you're not wrong. There is a runtime issue there. That if you're building GDB and you need the newer lib standard C++, that's something that has to be investigated for the other distributions that you choose to involve in what is effectively a stakeholder management issue with where is this new GDB going to get built and deployed. Wow. So it's not just the build side, but it is the deployment the run and runtime side as okay. well. Yeah, I kind of understood that Susie had something similar. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it wasn't it's familiar. It's the same, just different. <laughs> just different, yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, So many years ago, like five, six years ago, I used to build uh, LLVM and LLDB with MinGW. So what I found was that I, as such, language support was not the problem like C++11, but it was actually the library support, especially the threading side. So that was the problem, especially building LLDB with, was quite a nightmare. So I don't know if this concern applies to GDB too, but just wanted to point out. Uh, So I don't think that's, uh, I think the C++ 11, 14, I think that's orthogonal to that because that problem with, with threading libraries yeah. is. Threading li library in the MinGW, yes. Having? MinGW, threading support, so that was the problem, not the C++ 11 as such. So, but, but threading support in the library, C++ came in in C++ 11, so. We already require C++11, so that problem already exists. So you have to select if you are using the min W model or the POSIX model, or you can have even use libp thread from a third party that, like, that exists. But that's already a problem today. That's what I, I think. Or you think that's a problem with newer versions of C++? Yeah, uh, some details are sketchy in my mind, but that was the problem. Like, for example, uh, many of the threading function that came into C++11 but not supported as such. Mm -hmm. So uh, you, you so, will not yeah, be able we, to. We run, we've run into that more recently when we started adding more threading stuff in GDB. Yeah. And we do have like the code that does threading in GDB is wrapped in if that. Okay. And if, if you're compiling on MinGW mm -hmm. in, in the non-POSIX mode, I think the configure detects it as like threading doesn't work, it's broken. Yeah and just disables it. And GDB still works as it used to before, mm -hmm. just one thread. It doesn't parallelize, uh, but, it, but it does compile. Okay, that was mm -hmm. the sort of the stuff I did in like LLDB's SM point, yeah, so, uh -huh. okay. 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 Right, so, um, reviewed by tags, can, yeah, Bruno. Hi, yes, <clears throat> uh, I wanted to bring up the review by tags because um, a couple of issues, one of them, I've seen people pinging patches in the mailing list without being sure that they were uh, accepted already. Uh, so giving a review by tag would fix that. And also um, I think Carlos brought us up uh, in the, in the GNULIBC uh, buff about being a way to thank reviewers uh, for their time reviewing patches because nowadays it's sort of a thankless task to review patches. And it will be, uh, I think, a way to make uh, reviewing a little more interesting or a little more consistent for reviewers in general, right? So I wanted to bring up the idea of us starting to use reviewed by tags in the mailing list and wanted to see what everyone thinks. I think it's a good idea. I. I think I remember that we tried it for a very short period. Uh, but the problem back then was we didn't have a community agreement and one or two of us started doing it, but no one else was doing it. And then those that were doing it just, you know, it's not a policy in the project, so we stopped. 
but we could bring it up again. I'm not against it. Uh, I think it makes sense. And, and we already use tags to other things, like for example, the co-authored by tag. We've very quickly got used to using that uh, ever since we dropped change logs, because that information before was written in change logs. That was something that also happened in the past three years. We've dropped change logs. Um, and uh, yeah, it makes sense. And uh, I suggest that you send that as a proposal to the uh, GDB list uh, so that the whole community can uh, discuss that. OK, we'll do that. Thanks. Uh, but other people may agree or disagree. And just can, can you explain how, how these tags, how does the workflow uh, work? especially in our context, like who is responsible for, for applying it and how does this work? Well, the idea would be just that um, as you're reviewing a patch, uh, as you finish reviewing your patch, when you think you're fine with it going in, uh, you reply, you know, the final reply is like, looks good to me, and you add like a review by the, your name, email, the author would put that into his commit message, put, it's not much of a change from what we did now. It's just mostly uh, having in the log that e uh, it, it, it's just having in the log that someone reviewed it and giving like a, I don't know, an internet cookie for the person who reviewed it, right? And it's something that was brought up, some other thing about the review tags uh, that was brought up in the HGLibc buff was uh, they were doing the, in the, release notes, uh, these people have committed, then they are thinking about doing a, these people have reviewed patches and we'd like to thank them, which is another uh, internet cookie for the people who are helping, which is a nice thing for the current thankless task, you know? Uh, and I remember now that someone proposed using the testify tag also before. Uh, yeah. do, do you use that, uh, Carlos, on GDPC? Yeah. What the yeah. Sorry. What I'm wondering about that is basically the only p person who can accept a patch are the maintainers, which means that anyone doing some reviews, which is not oh, who is not a maintainer, will never show up in that. Is that uh, accurate? Like I do some review of patches, and I only send reviews when I find something wrong because I cannot accept uh, any patch. I'm not a reviewer, and so. Uh, does that mean that the only person you have in the end uh, who show in the git log are the actual maintainers who accepted the patch or do you like right. so. other people doing some effort, doing some reviews, uh, do not show up with this system or did I miss something? So yeah, I think for someone who submits a patch who's not familiar with the project and who the maintainers are, seeing a review by doesn't really convey enough information because, for example, he reviews a batch and says, looks good to me, reviewed by, but then he's not yet a maintainer. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it doesn't, just because there's a reviewed by doesn't mean the batch was approved. Yeah, uh, so um, but that will not solve it. Yeah, but our, our current uh, workflow also doesn't, also has the same problem. Like we still, like when I review or when Lancelot reviews, we still have to say, looks good to me, but I can approve it. Uh, and this would be exactly the same thing. Yeah, it's the so. same exactly, it's structured. Yeah, it's and, recorded. Just, and then you can aggregate more reviewed by tags. So like reviewed by Bruno and reviewed by Pedro right. and then and, goes and, in, right? And removes that awkwardness of having to say, I reviewed it, but you just say reviewed by. Yeah, uh, I can approve, but reviewed by. Yeah. So, you know. Yeah, which would be good because what actually happened because I I'm not maintainer, I cannot review patch. I do read a fair amount of patches, and when I have some which looks good to me, I, like, I'm not gonna say uh, that looks good to me because I'm not a maintainer, and I don't want to imply that there is any sort of agreement. So I only reply to a patch when I see a problem. I never um, have this, uh, this way to say, okay, I actually reviewed or tested this patch, and yeah. I cannot, Accept it, but it looks fine. Yeah, so the plus one in Garrett. Yeah. You don't do plus two, you want to do plus one, but it doesn't exist. So um, the, the key thing here is that reviewed by has nothing to do with the code being committed. 
So the contract for reviewed by was designed by the Linux kernel, which basically says, I, as a developer, have come and looked at this code, and everything that I might have complained about is cool with it. That's it. But the thing that that helps is like, as a senior maintainer, when I'm looking at code, if I saw Bruno and you do a review, I'd be like, this thing's probably almost ready. If Bruno and you agree on it, then I'm just gonna give it a look over and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna push it, right? So it helps me and like, when I do patchwork review, patchwork aggregates these as plus ones. There's an RBTB tab in patchwork that goes down the side and so when I'm scrolling through patches or when I use the CLI client, I can query, hey, how, show me all the patches that have RBs on them or more than one RB or more than two RBs. And sometimes you can process those really quickly as a maintainer right away. So the thing that I always tell the community is like, make it so I can review 100 patches in a day. And part of that process is new people becoming reviewers and helping with the review workflow. And there is a relationship of trust that has to exist, right? I have to trust that the reviewers are there. Can the system get gamed? Absolutely, it can get gamed when people come along and they just start reviewing by. But you pretty quickly realize that they're gaming the system if they haven't written any thoughtful comments or done anything. So. Um, so the RBs don't imply anything about it's going to get committed. It's just helping the community say, I'm a, I'm a person in this community, that looks good to me, it would answer all my problems. Doesn't mean it's ready to go in yet, but it does help. Yeah, and this ties to something that you told us in the GLFC buff, the idea of having a document that explains these things. Because you've now explained this once, and maybe we'll have to explain it again and again and again. It's always better to have what you also once told me. Yeah. Always answer with an URL. Yeah. I will write the reviewer doc. <laughs> uh, so in, in GDB's case, would it actually make sense to also have approved by? Uh, what? In yeah. GDB's case, would it also make sense to have a approved by, not just Oh, review? approved by. Yeah. Uh, because it's kind of like plus two. I mean, it, it, uh, it, you can kind of push it. But the commit. But in GDB, you can actually commit it, right? As a, yeah. as a submitter, you can submit it. You don't need to make for a maintainer, right? Uh, you still have submit rights. I mean, many people right. do. Even so I could approve your patch, and then you know you can push it. Yeah. I wouldn't push it. Yeah. OK. OK. And you have the history who actually approved it if, you know, sure. something. Yeah. Yeah. I guess it, they don't have it in the Linux because it's a pool model. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But for us, it's a bit different. Yeah. Well, so, uh, uh, Richard. So, if I if I get a review from somebody that requests uh, changes and I like redo parts of the change, and I repost, do I drop the previous reviewed by because of course they didn't review the patch I post, or do I still aggregate them? The, the requirement is if there are substantial changes, you have to drop the review okay. by because it is a new patch. So it's like if somebody says there's a typo, then I just keep them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But yeah. Sorry. As as Pedro knows, I'm 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 kind of new in the contribution and and reviewing game because I was kind of working before on on GDBs for, well, companies didn't really contribute so. Uh, I'm still curious about the changelog uh, thing because I still notice that people don't always add that. Is that oh. what's the politics there? Okay, so you there's no there's no requirement to like it's gone. You don't have to put anything in the changelog. You're not supposed to put anything in the changelog file. What does happen is not some, in the file in the in the submission. Yeah. So yeah. some people either because they're used to it as a way of describing parts of the patch or because maybe it happened to me like I've had written the patch before the changelog uh, requirement was dropped. And I already have it described that way. So you, you, can, you can leave it in the commit log if you want to. Uh, but there's no requirement to have one. But if you don't have one, you should make sure that your commit log is, you know, describes the, the commit properly. Uh -huh. Okay. Well, in either case you should, but the changelog for some kinds of patches was already helping with that, like if it's a patch that renames a function or um, you know, something more mechanical like that. 
that information would all be already be encoded in the change log. Right. Um, right. Uh, right. So, and the other topics that I, ha I have on the list are the topics that Louis raised. It, it's around the same area about about um, you know improving review. Uh, how can we improve this? This is like a perennial topic that appears every time we discuss in in every project project I guess. Um, It's all about manpower, uh, and uh, how can we improve this? Uh, we can't make other people do work, so each one of us needs to step up. There are some good, really good ideas in, in GLBC, I think, that we can borrow from. Um, uh, I'm, I'm actually looking forward to uh, appearing in one of their weekly meetings just to peek and see what, how that happens, learn from that experience, and that might be a good idea. If you're not familiar, uh, GLIPC, they do a, a weekly, it's weekly, right? Um, review session, one or two hours. One hour. One, <laughs> schedule for one hour, and I, I bet it extends sometimes. One hour, once a week. Right, and they go over patches and uh, that can, it's, it's a different way of thinking. It's like more in person. Uh, that might be a good idea, but of course requires commitment from people of showing up every, every week. Uh, and it's kind of scary for me, I, like, and I guess for you guys as well, it's like, I haven't done anything, I haven't done any review, and they're going to ask me about that patch that I should be reviewing and I don't have anything to, to say. So it puts pressure on yourself, which can be healthy. Um, and then you go review. And then you go review. Uh, Simon? Yeah. Hello. Um, so, in your weekly patch review thing, do you get technical or it's just delegating patches like you do this, you do this, you do this, and see you next week? Or you actually look at the code and. The, so, the, the kind of like the office hour for patches is intended to be 100% non-technical. But we nerd snipe each other all the time in that meeting, and it gets a little technical sometimes. Um, because when you're trying to find a reviewer for a thing, you sometimes have to be like, well, didn't you last touch that code? I saw you do the thing with the thing. And then you're like, no, I didn't touch that code. And then there's a little bit of a technical back and forth. So the meeting gets split into two half hour blocks. The first half hour is walk the queue and look at all the things that have been submitted. And oftentimes during that queue walk, you identify brand new contributors. And, um, you know, I'm not revealing anything magical here. I'm a technical lead at Red Hat. I have other engineers that are on my team. And sometimes those engineers are like, I'd love to help review. Can you just pick something for me to review? So oftentimes I will then just delegate to my team members as well. like. Okay, yeah, DJ's done this work. He's going to look at this malloc patch. Or I recently delegated um, the Risk Five patches for DJ to review, and I assigned delegate and patchwork for him so that he can track it. But half an hour is spent in the looking at the backlog and walking through the whole thing, non-technical, trying to find people to assign it. But it sometimes degenerates into technical discussions. Zabosh can can attest that we go really technical sometimes. We try not to. And then the other half hour is anybody who came. What do you want to raise? What patches that you submitted are blocked? Why do you think they're blocked? How, should, how can we move them forward? And sometimes that involves, again, a little bit of technical discussion. But we, we're trying to keep it high level because, honestly, if there needs to be a technical discussion, that needs to be had on the list. But this meeting is more like blockers. It's more like, sometimes at this meeting, I'm just like, I'm sorry, guys. Like, this whole week, I'm swamped. I'm building a fence outside. And I got all this other work I got to do. And there's no way I can review these things until two weeks from now. And so then someone will say, okay, well, then I'm not going to bother reposting this. I'm going to wait two weeks. And sometimes that context is just context that's hard to have except for walking into a one-hour one office hour and, and lay it out as you review patches if someone wants something done. How do you do those meetings? Is it, is it IRC or like No, video. video. Full, yeah. full video, like uh, people talking back and forth. So, yeah, it's not IRC. It, IRC right. would be slow. I think the, the data rate for the meetings is relatively high. Do you, would you have any comments, Zabosh? It's boring. Yeah, there's, 
I'm surprised that it's supposed to be completely non-technical. That's news to me. <laughs> but we, we make sometimes decisions like, oh, I think we should reject this patch. And then the conclusion is somebody has to reply on the mailing list that we reject this patch. But, and so you have to kind of look at sometimes details. But we go through the patch list. And to me, that's useful because uh, this is now the time when when I keep track what's going on in glibc because right. I, before that I randomly look that through the mailing list and see if there's anything that catches my eye that's interesting to me a patch but now I'm just listening to the uh, weekly patch review queue and I can hear all the patches that we go through uh, what is going on and then I'm, I'm up to date Right, so there, that touches a point that maybe people aren't as familiar, is that they are using patch tracker, uh, uh, patch, a, a patch tracker, tracker called Patchwork, Patchwork. Right. which GDB also tried a number of years ago, but it, we found it limiting at, this, at the time. It was the version one of Patchwork. Uh, it didn't handle patch series back then. We're on yeah. V3, it handled everything. Oh, I thought it was V2. Contributing to upstream patches. That's great. Yeah. So in, we have V3. It handles cover letters. It handles full series. It handles individual patches. DJ added support for comment events. So you can even trigger if someone makes a comment. And it also handles in the UI uh, setting individual things. Like if someone responds to something in the UX, you can view if a reviewer thought that that thing was an addressable comment that needed to be handled. Um, it supports aggregations of success warns and fails. It supports aggregation of reviewed by and tested by. And if you pull a patch using the command line client, it auto aggregates all the reviews for you and sticks it into the tail end of the commit message when you prep. So for example, when I'm ready to review a patch, I do git pw series apply foo, and it'll pull the whole series down, I kick it off on my testers, and if it comes back green, I begin reviewing the patches on the mailing list, and then if it looks good, then I give a reviewed by and tested by tag, and then if the person can't push, they usually say, oh, well, I can't push, then I'll push for them, or someone else will push if, if they see that there's enough reviews there. Yeah, it sounds like amazing improvement. Like a, a lot. Was... V3 has improved significantly, yeah. and we're at V3.1 at this point, so we, we try to keep adding features to it. Yeah. Um, we share a use case with the sub kernel subsystems that are also using patchwork to track their patches because they have very similar problems to what we do. Okay. To me, what's also is useful is, is this, uh, it can hook up this uh, pre-commit uh, uh, CI kind of thing. That, so it tells you if a patch applies and runs the test and is the regression, it's just, very currently, our the mechanism to hook things up to patchwork is uh, a bit complicated, and that's the only reason I haven't hooked up AR64 builders. But I'm that's on my list. That uh, I think it would be very useful to hook up many different machines uh, to do uh, just do a build on every patch that's submitted because I think we have the resources. You, you've got your browser. Up. Go to patchwork. I have, I yeah. <laughs> That's on you. We'll open my kids, Minecraft, know. whatever. Yeah. I have Google, Chrome. Yeah. It's in Just my to account. Show you what the green looks like. So patchwork.sourceware.org. Patchwork. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you what? Source? Sourceware.org. Oh. Yeah. There you go. The, I have to press OK somewhere. First one. Okay. Slapdog cannot connect to that one for okay. some reason. Can you? Oh, you can't connect to the other one? No, it doesn't work for some reason. So can you now go to Patrick? Project test is already there. Yeah, excellent. Uh, click on the glibc. Can you hit the bottom left one and click view patches? So for example, those are all, the greens are all pre-commit CIs passed. Yeah, sorry. So in this case, the greens are all pre-commit CI passes, and um, those are pre-commit CI fails in the red there, so it's probably like patch failed to apply, so people are not doing a good job there. 
scroll down. I don't know why Florian's patch actually didn't run the tester. There's an RB right there. So if you stop that, that one right there with Florian, it's got a reviewed by. So right away for me, when I'm doing a check, that catches my eye to say, okay, someone's already reviewed that. Has it been committed or not? So, you, so. and you click here to see the whole series? Yep. Yeah, it shows you the whole series. Perfect. So yeah. I personally would like to try something like this, but other people you know, might not enjoy as much the email, the email mailing list workflow uh, and would, might prefer something else, try GitLab or something. Um, my opinion would be to try something like this. So in, like, we had that Garrett experience uh, a few years ago and my, my opinion was that it doesn't work for a community of our size. It's very, very easy to lose track of what's going on. You cannot follow discussions properly. Um, and you know, patch series, they don't work in a native way in that tool. But maybe some other tools would work. And I think- We, we couldn't get Garrett to work either. Yeah. We, we demoed Garrett for six months and tried to do it. I think someone was, was Simone wanted to say something? What? My turn? Do you, do, do you want to say something? Yeah, uh, just cross my thought, but in case there's some people asking questions on Zoom, I don't know if ah. somebody matters, but uh, yeah, I would also, you know, love something like this. Uh, you know, one of, one of the reason I wanted to try Garrett back then is be able to get a, a view of what are the open changes and, you know, if we end up rejecting a patch here, we mark it as rejected, so it's, we don't ever see it. Um, you know, maybe I guess you're able to sort by what's the pending patch that's been there for the longest. So I can like, if I want to review one one of patches a day, I can just pick by who has been in the queue for the longest time. Yeah, I, but I guess you can. So any question that you want to ask, you just write it in a Python script. And so like this UI is like the thin shim over the database that's tracking all the data that's associated with the patches. But the reality is like, it's got some, if you scroll up to the top header, it, it doesn't, um, like you can sort by date and do some things like show patches with for a second up there on the top left. What? Or, on the top uh, left, there's a show patches with. Yeah, if you click that, you get a pull down. So you can do some search, but like, for example, the complicated service level indicator that I'm compute. What? Someone review that. Yeah. So that's actually my patch, and Florian asked me for changes, so I got to go change it. It's an outstanding patch from like a year ago. Um, it's sitting there. I will get to it. I promise. Um, so it, this is why it's 158 days to get a patch through the terminal state to glibc. So the. For example, like I have a complex service level indicator and I just wrote a Python script because this is just REST APIs. So you can interact with Python in whatever REST API you want to drive whatever answer or decision making process that you want. And what I like about this is that it still leaves us with this decentralized development workflow that we're all used to developing in. Whether or not it's the best, I feel like this is a, this for me has improved it. And like Pedro, you know, if I was the only one using Patchwork, it still helps me, right? Like, I'd have to do more work to clean things up. Thankfully, the more community members contribute, the easier it is to kind of track state and, and, and do things. But it definitely helps from an automation perspective. But it's up to you guys to choose if that, that has value for you. Um, I was going to say, we did do a Garrett evaluation for six months in glibc, and we also found it incredibly difficult to use, mm -hmm. hard to track the, the recommended outcomes, the changes, the individual things between push revisions and new revisions, the same change set ID. It was easy to lose track of recommendations, whereas when an email-based workflow, I'm just going to go read the whole thread. And from yeah. the thread top to bottom, I go and I start answering things. Um, if you look at um, Javier Pello's uh, Remove Legacy Hardware Caps, it actually failed pre-commit CI, so he submitted a new V2. Click on the first patch there. I want to just show you something. First patch? Yeah, first patch, yeah. So, um, okay, yeah, that's DJ's Tribot there that's trying things. Okay, no one's commented on it yet, okay. 
Um, I was just looking for a patch that had a comment on it because oh. you can make comments. Is it, is but you, a... what I was going to say is you don't need to use any of this web UI. None of it, it, you don't have to use any of it. You can just use the command line client and drive it all via automation and command line. And like the only times we walk into here is on the weekly review where it's nice to kind of scroll through a list and have a conversation. But when I'm at my terminal and I'm working away on patch review, I, I'm pulling patches and doing stuff in the CLI. Yeah. Just Back then when we tried Garrett, I didn't have any experience with Garrett. That was my first attempt at using it. I found it confusing at the beginning. Uh, but at AMD, we use Garrett internally. And so I've had sufficient experience now. And my opinion hasn't changed. Even to the worst slide? No. <laughs> uh, I, think, I think for a small group like ours, it's OK. But for a community. Well, I mean, in your opinion, did it get worse than before when you actually used it? Uh, it was pretty low at the beginning already. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so just one question to, for people using Patchwork. Um, it's still compatible with a, someone who wants to do just 100% mailing list based work as we do today in, uh, in GDB. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, someone has to, like, the, the only maybe quibble would be if you go into the database and you mark the patch rejected, you should have already posted to the mailing list and said, this patch will not be applied because of the following reasons, right? So, like, the, the markup in the database, the database is just, it's layered on, it's a workflow layered on top of the distributed workflow, and it assists and helps in that workflow, right? So you can ignore it completely if you don't want to deal with it, if you want to have public inbox and pull your patches with public inbox, or you just want to apply the patches out of your mailbox, you can do that. So I think it lets you ramp up different workflows that can help different people track different patches. Yeah. Um, we're officially out of time, even though we did start a little bit late. But um, there's a question here. From, from Gaius on, on Zoom. Gaius, you can speak up if you're still here. Are you here? I can see you, but I cannot hear you. Are you speaking? Oh, he is, but we're not. Well, the meter is moving. The meter is moving, but we don't hear it. Oh, OK, so let's try this. Uh, I don't know. No, I'm sorry. I don't know how to convince this to work. Um, uh, it was working earlier. Yeah. Who is speaking? This person. Oh, he is Mark Green on the Zoom. That means that we are part of the things in the room. Oh, it was moving before when he was speaking. Okay. Yeah, that's us. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah. Yeah. yeah we sorry, guys. We, guys, we, we cannot hear you, but I see you're typing now. Uh, so let me repeat your question. Does this also apply for new languages about to go into GCC, uh, but have GDB test cases, or could this be detected during configure? Uh, I think you were talking about when we were discussing about C++ and moving to a newer version. Uh, so uh, we were discussing how to build GDB, which version of GCC of C++ to build GDB, not what we can debug. Uh, and in, in your case, it's up to you which version of uh, uh, what was the language module module two that you you, you would want to support. All right, so I think I answered your question. Um, so uh, I mean, we're officially out of time, so we should wrap this up, I guess. Um, the other topic that was on 
Lewis's topics was pre-commit testing. And to me, this also means taking a look at what GDPC is doing, but also attending Marcus's BOF uh, tomorrow, I think. And he's going to be talking about improvements at Sourceware in the Sourceware infrastructure, or the build bot is, they are building, building up, and see about integrating into that. Uh, so thank you all.